Welcome to the Relationship and Intimacy Masterclass. In this class, we'll be talking about themes that come up in relationships like um, sensuality, finding your confidence, finding your group, and also some of the challenges that come up like conflict resolution, um, breakups even. And so I'm really excited to be sitting here with these ladies, some of my really good friends, and they're really smart. And um, let's just jump into this conversation. But first, thank you for joining. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. <sighs> you. You felt that? Like the collective yeah. breath of like, <laughs> And so, like, one of the themes that, that come up for me first is um, um, feeling confident and feeling sexy again. Um, what has, what's on your mind, Belinda, mm. about that confidence and sexy? Well, when I think about confidence and sexy, I think about Erica. <laughs> <laughs> I think she's my go-to girl. <laughs> Erica is a certified wellness and life coach who works with women to boost and embody their sexual confidence. And we've become fast friends and had had a lot of incredible conversations. Um, and I have a question for you, Erica, to start us off, which is what's the first step to feeling sexy? First step to feeling sexy is feeling confident within yourself. Mm -hmm. Confident in your skin, confident in your movement, and confident in your life. Mm -hmm. And I think oftentimes we think it has to be something so much bigger than that, mm -hmm. so much more dramatic and more insa insatiable or whatever. But it's really about coming back to you, finding your pleasure, and having the confidence to walk about the world and feeling just good with who you are. Mm -hmm. okay. So I know that this comes up for a lot of us women, but how as a woman do I make time for me? Because mm. none of us have time for each other or for ourselves. We have time for everyone else, right? That's usually what happens, right? Uh, making the time is crucial. And we have to find the time that we can't feel guilty. We can't feel that we just can't give to us because we are so depleted often because we're giving to everyone else. So we have to reframe it. And we have to be able to fill our well first mm. so that we can give to everyone else. Okay, so you just wrote a book. I did. <laughs> Feel sexy again. <laughs> so now why are we revisiting the feeling? What happened? Good question. Yeah. <sighs> Things happen in life, right? We have these, these transitions in life that happen sometimes where it takes us away from who we are. It could be a, a job. It could be kids it could be a relationship and oftentimes that taps us taps the energy that we have for ourselves and we kind of get lost in who who we are is that individual so being able to really reclaim that for ourselves and tap back into well who do we want to be because I think for most of us there might have been a time when we felt on top of the world a little bit we felt empowered and we felt that we kind of had it going on and I want to bring that back for women to be able to say, it ain't dead yet. I'm still here, and I'm going to make it even better this time around. And, you know, to follow up to that, I mean, in this culture that we live in today where I even want to say, like, how do we define sexy? Because it feels so confusing when I think about my daughter, who's almost 13, my stepdaughter's, you know, 19, 21, and then being a 30-something or 40-something, 50-something, how do you work with women to address sexy, whether it's at their age or their life stage, or what does it mean to you when you work with women like that? Mm, such a great question. I think, you know, this age of social media and selfies and sexting and all that kind of stuff, right? I mean, it's there are so many bombardments of this is how we're supposed to look in today's society. Whether you're 17, like my daughter, but... Whether you're 25, 35, 55, 75, 90, whatever, we have to be able to kind of push that aside and all of those images that we see and what we think we should be and really be able to come to really an understanding of how we want to feel inside of that and what that means for us. And it's very subjective. It's very individual. And it's about the exploration of how that feels, kind of almost like 
putting on different hats, whatever, <laughs> to decide <laughs> Read what book is to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> to really decide what sexy means for you as an individual. Mm. So, Erica, I have a question, and um, I'm asking for a friend, not for me. <laughs> um, can you give us some feel sexy tips, like uh, perhaps some moves? A little birdie told me that you were a Zumba instructor at one time. Oh. <laughs> I was a Zumba instructor at one time. Um, I was also a Latin instructor, and I'm also an S-factor um, practitioner. So I do a lot of authentic movement, authentic uh, feminine movement, which is a big part of my practice and kind of a big re reason why I kind of started to think about this book because this book taps something for me that this movement for us as women we need to capture whatever that that feeling is to be feminine and for me it was finding this practice that really embodied the feminine and the sexy for what I felt that I needed in my life mm -hmm. so, so I'm not show. gonna get up and do something okay, okay. Fine. we don't have to do that <laughs> So, Erica, what are some of the people that you're helping? Like, what do you what are you hearing from them about like the work that you're doing with them and mm -hmm. the book and how it's relating to their lives okay. in surprising ways that you didn't realize your book is going to actually affect them? That's an amazing question uh, because when I started this process, the people who I thought I was going to reach has has shifted a little bit, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm sure it will shift even more so. Um, but for example, I have a woman who is a very, very high in a, a corporate job, and she gave me a glowing review that I was stunned by because she said that she'd never been able to really talk to her good friends about her own sexuality and things in her life that were really intimate. And she told me that my book actually helped her start conversations with her good girlfriends about this, these feelings that she was having, but she felt that she wasn't deserving to talk about or deserving to feel in herself. So starting conversations, honestly, I think is a big theme of what I wanted to have out that comes out of this book. Yeah. So thank you for that question. Yeah, and you know, as we're all learning, the relationships between women is not necessarily easy. And what you just got acknowledged by your book is that the book is a door that's opening for women to actually have conversations about intimacy that they wouldn't have had otherwise. So thank yeah. you for yeah. writing this book for women and for, I know a lot of us have daughters, yeah. mm. for the daughters that are coming up to be in adulthood and mm. having sexuality as a practice. <laughs> so I'm finding that um, um, confidence and uh, lack thereof also ties into like feelings of unworthiness. We kind of alluded to this earlier. Um, so, like, what are some like practices that we can share with um, our friends who are watching at home that they can do right now in this mm -hmm. moment? Mm -hmm. Feel sexy again. Well, I think a lot of it is giving yourself a break. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. so often we don't trust our own intuition. We don't trust that we have the tools inside to be able to tap this into what we need for ourselves. So really like being kind and gentle with ourselves, being forgiving and trying to let all the noise that we, that we have in our own heads and all these bombardments of other people and things, wipe it away, wipe it away and then be able to really be able to come back to you and decide what's really true for you. Okay, I have a tip. Okay. Do you want to hear it? Yes. I picked this up um, at a uh, Regina Thomas Hauser. She wrote this book um, called uh, Pussy. Mm -hmm. right. We're all familiar. Yes, we're all familiar. <laughs> and so and one, of her, one of her tips and techniques um, to tap into your sexy was to think about your pussy. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> So you've tried this? Yes. Are you thinking about her right now? <laughs> of course. I think we might be. <laughs> Can you guys guess what I'm thinking about? Absolutely. Thank you, ladies. Yeah. Oh, of Thank course. Look at how we all got a little sexy. <laughs> yeah, yeah so we all just started doing like this. Tip number one.
and like moving like this, all of a sudden like yes, falling all over each other. It's sexy also is like, it's just, it's that creative energy, right? Mm -hmm. creative yes. Energy. Creative energy and is flow. where it's at, right? Yes. yes. Right. Yeah. If you think about the masculine energy and the feminine energy, right? The feminine is soft and yeah. flowy yeah. and, and delicious and voluptuous, right? And moving, right? Yeah. Not rigid, right? Exactly. So we yeah. bring that to you. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and sexy is also like, it is also for us, right? It's for our own pleasure and also for our partners. And it's not their jobs to do that for us. That really is up to us. Mm -hmm. And so we have to find that. So it's interesting that you would bring up our partners or um, um, sensuality and sex. <laughs> because Sequoia, my friend, <laughs> is an advanced Tantra educator and um, a relationship and intimacy expert. Yes. So you deal a lot about sex. I do. I consider myself a sexpert. <laughs> Sequoia the sexpert. <laughs> yeah. So Sequoia, your book is um, your book is called It's Hard. Mm -hmm. Um, and it talks about how to beat erectile dysfunction yes. and find sexual satisfaction. Yes. So how do you beat it? Right. Well, so thank you. <laughs> <That's a> beautiful <laughs> introduction no, to you my know. work and everything. No one knew right. So um, the lovely thing about um, the title of my book is it's saying how hard it is for all of us. Um, not just women, but also men. Um, but if you can... Um, really get a handle. <laughs> the new windows that go along with my book are just vast. Um, uh, if you can get beyond um, and get the, a handle around what sensuality actually is and sexuality actually is and um, ecstasy and bliss and all of that, if you can actually understand it at a deeper level, you can prevent some of these dysfunctions that really a lot of us have experienced. And in the book, I talk about how I went through my own challenges with erectile dysfunction. And most people would be like, what are you talking about? You're a woman, you don't have, a, you know, you don't have erection. Yes, I do. And all of you women have erections as well. We just don't have the same kind of phallic erection because our erection is more inside. So one of the things that I'm teaching men is not only about their erection and um, I call it the stages of a man's erection. Um, I start out the book, um, do you guys like Shakespeare and theater? Sure, yeah, I love so, theater. So, I love dramatics. So <laughs> some of the earliest um, education I got was um, in the theater and I, I really structure my book based on the ideas that I learned by teaching creative dramatics. And one of them is that we go through different stages in our life. And so I start out the book with a quote from As You Like It, Shakespeare's As You Like It, The Seven Stages of Man. To really say we start out as mewling, puking, you know, babies. And we go back to that at the very end of our life cycle. And if we can honor that part of us that's a little child and see that in everybody else and be responsible for some of the most intimate interactions we have with anybody and show reverence for the human being that you're choosing to go through a very vulnerable experience with. And if we can start that, this is how you beat it, right? You beat it by actually starting your sexual experience out with reverence instead of just People actually have a hard time with how I describe this, but skin bags slapping together for friction. Mm -hmm. Skin bag sex is what most pornography is. And pornography is right now one of the biggest epidemics that we have for our young people, starting as young as 10, right? But the porn addiction goes all the way through every single age, all the stages of man. And... So the way we beat that is instead of having... I have to interrupt you yeah. because you said something really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, well, first of all, you got my attention. You got everybody's attention. <laughs> said porn. And um, I, I think, I don't have the, the numbers on this right, but I think the number one visited 
website on the website after Google is a porn site. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. So this is an epidemic that I believe the solution is to find reverence in the act that we're doing. That it's not skin bag friction experiences. That is so empty. If you have an Emory board and you're filing an Emory board with another Emory board, it's going to create heat. That's fine. But actually there's no, there's nothing embodying that experience, which is why you have this hungry ghost like experience. Do you know the term hungry ghost? It's like somebody who has a bottomless pit where they keep drinking and drinking and drinking or needing this addiction kind of so that's where we've gotten to with sex because porn is just this observation of these people, you know, slapping their skin bags together. And then the children are growing up thinking that that's what sex is. And then when we get married, we as women are like, okay, I guess I'm supposed to lay here and let the other skin bag, you know, slap into my skin bag. <laughs> and I'm sorry, that's like, if you think about that image, it really does kind of go, wait, don't we all want more than that? Isn't that what we're all writing about in our books? Yeah. So for me, what I teach with tantric yoga is first of all, white tantra is your own personal practice. How do I find, very similar to what Erica is talking about, how do I find within myself the love of not only my skin bag, but how do I fill that skin bag out to be whole and complete and filled with this experience of soul? So how do you do that? Tell our friends. We want to know. Actually, yeah. That's my question. How, how will Tantra improve uh, erectile dysfunction in people? Yeah, so you connect with that reverence by learning how to be intimate. Now, learning how to be intimate is... Um, it's easy, not simple. And it might be simple, not easy. But one way would be to eye gaze. So with my lover, what I will do before we actually engage I'm gonna, I'm gonna, in... Gonna in yes, right? She's, she's <laughs> eye gazing. All she's eye gazing with me, people. And she's got some of the most beautiful blue eyes, by the way. And at the red carpet event, she's wearing this beautiful blue dress that's got, like, her eye color all over it. Um, so when you eye gaze... You stare into your partner's eyes and you, you breathe in a rhythmic breathing where you breathe together, you ground yourself so the whole energy system starts at the base and the base of your energy system needs to be grounded in the earth, which is, by the way, what we all did before we got onto this whole conversation. Mm -hmm. You ground yourself and you just sit and you stare into your partner's eyes. You then um, uh, synchronize each other's breathing, so you take in a breath at the same time, and you exhale at the same time. And you notice any thoughts that you have as leaves on a river that just float on by. There's no need to pick up the leaf and go, oh, this leaf is brown and it's crunchy and it's gonna like, right? You literally just let those thoughts go on by and you observe and witness, witness your partner. The whole process is meant for you to be known and for the other person to be known. And in that way, when we can know the other person, Dr. Ruth says the Hebrew word for sex is to know the other person. So what are we really trying to do? Are we trying to create heat and friction and this, this constant need to like think that it, we're going to have this explosive firework and we're constantly trying that? No, it's to be known. It's to acknowledge the other person and be witnessed and say, I'm so glad I get to have you as my partner right now. Thank you for touching my life. Thank you for setting aside everything else to just sit here with me. That makes me feel significant. It makes me feel like there's a certainty about my relationship with you. I can see that there's all kinds of varieties of things we get to do. You're contributing to me. And the reverence. Mm -hmm. And the right reverence. And I feel right. it. I feel it right now. Yeah. I know. I'm all teary-eyed. I always so, get teary-eyed. <laughs> short of like, you know, doing a collective prayer before uh, entering into a connection. 
yeah. so to speak. Um, what do you recommend for those who don't have a partner, but also want to, to tap into that? Thank you. I actually have in my book um, a meditation that is a self, what I call self-honoring sexual meditation. So I teach people how to have masturbation be an opportunity to have reverence with yourself. And that's not have a five minute, let's see how quickly I can have an orgasm so I can go to sleep. That is a wake up in the morning and you set a timer for you start out slow and then you move it higher and higher as you get better at it. But you started it like 10 minutes and you masturbate and touch yourself and really not to climax. You're not goal oriented. You're giving yourself pleasure for pleasure's sake. Pleasure for pleasure's sake, not for an end result. And if you did that every morning, not, you don't have to orgasm at the end. Just touch yourself, honor yourself. You can run a mantra over and over again. I am my first and foremost lover. I am the person who gets to create the life that I love and I get to touch myself. There's no head human, right? There's no head human. We actually get to be our head human and choose the way we like to be touched. The more we can know what, what feels good to us, the more we can share that with our partners. Exactly. And our partners then will want us to have those things. Yeah. Well, and one of the things I just love about what both of you are sharing is how personalized we're talking about getting really personalized with our life experience, whether it's around sexual confidence, body confidence, sex with a partner, sex with ourselves, whatever it is we're actually talking about today is really having this kind of internal compass and internal way of directing how we want to have our life experience, which is right now. We don't know what happens after, and we don't, you know, do we want to spend much time thinking about that while we have what we have right now, this opportunity? Right. So mm. I just, yeah. I love it. Because I think when we're talking about so many of the topics, too, we're so influenced and informed by messages outside of ourselves, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Messages about how we should be, how we shouldn't be, how we should have sex, how we shouldn't. I mean, we've just touched on so many taboo topics already right. in 20 minutes of talking. Yes. Right, and you're pointing to another aspect of my book, which is teaching people how to create. Because most of us are living a default life. We're living a default life that we feel like we have to live because those are the circumstances that we've been given. Like, this is porn, and this is how sex is supposed to be because obviously that's what we're seeing, right? But no, actually, you individually, every single one of us and every single one of you gets to choose how you have sex. There, that's what I meant by there's no head human. Nobody gets to tell me how sex works best for me. Now, we can go out and learn, and by the way, I think educating yourself and becoming an expert at sex is a very important part to enlightenment. It's very important because what sex is, is it's utilizing the second chakra, which is the chakra of creation. Mm -hmm. And how do we need to really learn how to manifest things? We need to tap into the energy of creation and creating your life the way you want it, which is what we were talking about. We created this whole talk show for the fact that we wanted to have this conversation with each other. Mm -hmm. And we said we want it to look this way. And guess what? It is. I mean, we manifested <laughs> yeah. this whole thing, not because we left it to a default. Mm. We got some powerful right? manifestors at this table. Yes, we do. So yes, we can we talk about sex forever. Yeah. Um, I have a couple of stories that I can probably share oh my right God, now. I just got all wet. <laughs> <laughs> I spilled my water all over me. No, we got I need powerful a sip of water. <laughs> 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 I am going to have a sip of water after that. Sip your water. Sip your tea. And so, I'm yeah, good. thank yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> um, a, a tissue uh, ball. Yeah, no, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so when we we come up with, uh, let's just like 
take a breath after that. Thank you, Belinda, for leading us in that yes. deep breath. Exactly. Because one of the things we um, that comes up is, um, um, you know, we have, uh, there are relationships. And then there, are, sometimes we have upsets and conflicts in relationships. Sometimes we have upsets and conflicts in having sex and intimacy. Sometimes we have upsets and conflicts in our own self-image. Um, and we have Belinda here. Who is the master of conflicts? She is the master of So says my family. <laughs> well, Belinda. Belinda is a transformative mediator and relationship coach. And from the moment I met her, we were already talking divorce, remarriage, states of relationships, just such an open beautiful book who you are and so intelligent when you are talking about how you are figuring this out for couples in you know a lot of this is obviously high conflict you know I'm really I the master I think you are a master at conflict resolution mm -hmm. and being able to really sit with these couples and trying to figure out what their needs are and it's not only just do I stay or do I go, right? There's a third option in there, and I think that you are the, the expert in what that can be. So I want to ask this question. So your book, What Happened to My Happily Ever After. Love the title. Explores the conflict, <laughs> no kidding. Explores a conflict within relationships. And, and it's the decision to stay or go, but how do you help people make that decision? Mm. I love what we've been talking about because it's such a great lead in to this. You know, even the title, coming up with the title, which was really just sort of gifted to me in a way, what happened to my happily ever after, you know, shows us again that kind of mass thinking, that maybe national, global, you know, we have lots of traditions around the world about how people think about relationship and what it's supposed to be when we partner with that person that we think is gonna be the person we walk on the planet with for 50, 60, 80, however many years. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the first things when I meet people, any people, it doesn't matter if you're like on the verge of divorce or you're just getting married and just had a baby, you just bought a house, you've just lost a house, you know, the market crashes. I mean, the first place we go to is conflict in any relationship that's closest to us to kind of diffuse that that energy, that internal conflict, right? So um, I think that one of the things is to start recognizing these expectations and preconceived notions that conflict is not supposed to exist because that was what we were sold, right? We were sold the happily ever after. Yes. If I love him, if she, she loves me, if we get married, we put a ring on it, we buy a house together, we have a kid, whatever it is, that somehow we're gonna just walk off into the sunset and he'll be my forever person, she'll be my forever person. And I really think that that's where the reframing begins. It's literally like, I don't even wanna to talk to you about what conflict you're experiencing right now. Let's talk about the mindset that you came into your relationship with or the, conflict, the mindset that you're existing out of a relationship, because frankly, when we divorce, most often what people are doing is telling a big story about that relationship, so the conflict is continuing inside, right? So it's about taking a step back and pausing for a minute and understanding what were all those ideas that I had about what it was supposed to be. And that's really where a lot of the suffering comes up, right? That's where the, the internal conflict is really bubbling because we're, we're, we're fighting against this internal sense of, here's how it is, but I thought it was supposed to be this way, and what do I do now, right? So even before we get to make a decision about what to do next, we've got to sit with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is it a matter of um, um, high expectations versus no expectations? You know, no expectations is expectations. Sorry. Good point. <laughs> Like right. No choice. You're still making a choice. Right? Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. It's expectations, period. And I don't, you know, it's not about saying, okay, like the world is perfect 
and we're going to accept everything that shows up. But it's about starting to get really clear about sort of that background thinking that we were mentioning earlier and starting to explore, like both of you are ta have been talking about, what is the life that I want to create? And how do I even know the life that I want to create if I don't even know what is my thinking versus my parents, my education, my community, my religion, my culture, right? We need to start having conversations around these things because often, you know, how many times have you gotten into a fight with your, your spouse, your partner, your boyfriend, your parents, your kids, and afterwards you're like, we're not even sure what we were fighting about. Oh, yeah. It's like, and then we don't even, we're not even sure we believe what we're fighting about. Or you have the same yes. argument over and over again, and you're like, why are we still arguing about this five years later when we, we keep arguing about it, right? Mm -hmm. Totally. So um, what is the best way to handle a conflict in relationship then? What are one of the steps that you could share with us from your book? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it goes back to, you know, what are we fighting? What are we really fighting about? You know, we've got to start, I mean, I, I think when you guys talk about, you know, porn and, and the different crises we're having on the planet, we're having a conflict crisis because the way that most people are holding conflict right now is he did something to me, the president did something to my community, the, 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 there's not peace on the planet because this country is fighting against this one and this one is right and this one is wrong or the next day it's vice versa. Uh, you know, I really think that the first step is starting to take that personal responsibility and that accountability about conflict residing within each of us and really getting real. And it doesn't mean there aren't lots of conflicts happening around us because I know for some people watching, you know, especially if we bring up the president, like we could get into a whole debate for hours and hours about the president. Is he right? Is he wrong? Is he this? Regardless of anybody's views, we're not talking about views being right or wrong. What we're really talking about is getting deep and honest about the conflict that's existing in us, how we are perpetuating our own internal mm -hmm. conflict, mm -hmm. and how that frames how we look at the world. Absolutely. So if you want to start resolving conflict in your relationships, that's where you start. You do not start by trying to get, you know, how many of us have tried to get our husbands into therapy, read a book, uh, you know, go have a conversation with someone or try to like plant them down in front of us and have that three hour conversation that's going to solve all of our marriage problems, right, yeah. right? It's not working. And this is why people are on the verge, like, you know, too good to leave, too bad to stay because we're trying to force this as opposed to taking this deeper internal look and accountability around how we are helping to maintain and sustain states of conflict and states of our lack of personal responsibility about how it is. Mm. I feel like um, this conflict arises when we try to fix the other person and um, make it about them not being like living up to your expectation of them. And so I, I really want to, like, I guess my question is, well, how do you find peace within the turmoil? How do you stay in the middle, the eye of the storm? Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I, coming back to that whole idea of expectation, you know, one of the things that has been a personal practice for me, you know, I got married at a young age and thought, okay, there's my happily ever after. Pretty soon after, right, it wasn't. Got married again, thought it was, and then really had that kind of dark, you know, dark moment of the soul, uh, which was three years. It was not one moment. It wasn't a moment. <laughs> it was three years of really going deep. Um, and one of the things that I did during that time was spend a lot of time just thinking about why are we in relationship to begin with? Why was I going into relationship to begin with? Now, there's like those surface answers again, right? To partner with someone, to get married, to make babies, because that's what my parents did, or that's what my parents didn't do, because I need someone. I mean, we have all these different answers, but I know for myself, I hadn't really sat down and said, like, what's deeper than that, really? Like, why would I choose that, knowing that it's not easy? amount of the time because I'm an individual, you're an individual, 
You have your life experience. I have mine. Your point of view, I have mine. And I don't care how well matched people are. Our differences and our, our different ways of seeing the world and or, you know, one person wants their underwear on the floor and the other wants it in the laundry basket. Like, they'll come out eventually, right? So so part of, of navigating this is to really sit down and have a conversation with why would I choose to be in any relationship to begin with? And having that deep, deep inquiry so that when you find your person, Mm -hmm. you find a person, I'm gonna also say, right? I think we have to shift this a little bit. Like there's one person on the planet. You Mm -hmm. could partner with many, many, many people. But if you don't know what that internal guidance system is, if you don't know and you're not communicating that with your partner, whether you're in the middle of a relationship or looking for a relationship at the end or at the beginning, these are the kinds of conversations we're not having with ourselves. So we're definitely not having them with current or potential people in our lives. Is there, um, were you going to say something? I, I felt you. I yeah. felt. <laughs> Do you want me to go? Yeah, go for it. So um, I'm really loving this um, deep dive into conflict because I think what I experience a lot in relationships and Um, just to kind of bring it out on the table, relationships are changing. The the configuration of relationships going forward with all of our children's generation, there's gender fluidity and there's relationship fluidity and right and identity fluidity. And so what I'm finding is that people are like not having traditional relationships anymore. I'm what would be considered free love some people would categorize myself as like polyamorous. So I have lots of different relationships. And what strikes me is that some people actually expect to not have arguments and conflict. And so I pose this question to you, like, what do you feel about this whole idea that, you know, what you were saying, if we have the perfect relationship, if I found the one, you know, we're never gonna fight. But how about, like, fighting is actually normal. Conflict is actually what you're saying, right? That's what I'm hearing you say is conflict is a part of every relationship. It's going to look different with different skin, right, different kinds of costumes. But we're going to have to deal with conflict in everything. So how about we find a process through it instead of avoid it Mm. and feel like and resist it? Right. So how? For sure. Oh, it's like that's the juice right Right. there. Right. This is this is what I feel like I've been spending my entire life sort of contemplating. And I tell people, you know, when we start having this conversation that um, I don't like conflict. Like people will be like, gosh, you're you're in it. You do it for a living. You're always having these discussions with your family. You're always trying to resolve it. You want to be a peacemaker, et cetera. And I say, I don't like conflict but I love conflict. And here's Mm. the difference. It's uncomfortable. It is uncomfortable. I don't care how many practices we do when we are in conflict with another person, it's uncomfortable. But the next question to ask is, you know, what's the opportunity there? And I think Mm. that's where the shift is happening, where it's, it's, it's beyond accepting that this is part of humanity and part of that, this experience, which is already amazing, right? If the whole planet could ex- accept that, and I think many cultures are better at doing that than the US, frankly, because we're doing a lot to avoid conflict, drinking, drugging, etc. cetera. Um, but this idea of loving conflict, even as I say it, and maybe as you guys feel it, mm-hmm. loving conflict gives it some space for us to be in a question about what's it here for? Why, why am I feeling this? What's, what's the information that's available? What needs to change in the way that I'm in this family dynamic, in this relationship dynamic, in a work dynamic, wherever it is? Loving the conflict is, is like, gives us the space to not anticipate that horrendous, those feelings, and do the reactivity that we generally do, right? The fight, flight, freeze, which actually prevents us from being with it at all. And because we're not with it when it happens, we're doing everything to avoid it, then what do we do? We, see here a moment, right? We, um, while you're 
your burning Having my senior moment. Burning, burning, please. I have a burning question, <laughs> so and much. I can feel the people. Thank you for people, saving me. <laughs> I can feel the people who are watching this um, asking this question. Well, okay, Melinda, I hear you. Do the self-interrogation. But can you give us, like, one actionable item mm. to do when we find ourselves in the middle of all this? Because mm. we don't always... Conflicts is uncomfortable, and we forget everything <laughs> that we've learned. Or yeah. it just and we just lose reptilian it. Reptilian brain, right? That's reptilian it. brain takes what over. Is, so when you're in reptilian brain, what can we do in conflict? Yeah, you know the first, and it sounds like the simplest thing in the world, but we're just not doing it. It's breathing. Mm-hmm. I mean, look at how many times we took deep Coming breaths. To the breath. Mm-hmm. How many times yeah. we paused? I mean, even just now, right? Mm-hmm. I could have like made this big deal. I forgot what I was going to say. And that's internal conflict, right? I want to look good. I want everyone to think, right? (laughs) And you, you spoke and I I breathed, right? And it's sort of like, it reminds us to be here now. It reminds us we're not going to die. Generally speaking, (laughs) there's no tiger. And you're learning from that experience, right? I mean, it's, it's a learning opportunity. And that breathing gives us that time to then, to then pause and, and reflect in that moment. Mm-hmm. And you have something new come in too. Yeah. That that breathing is allowing space such that what the download that was coming to you has time to actually land in your physical form. Yeah. And that's something that we're all rush, rush, rush. Everything is immediate gratification. Yeah. And the pausing, you know, the breathing is also about when you, I think you mentioned before, Lenina, that we're, we're doing the same things over and over again. We have these high expectations of having the perfect relationship, then we're operating in the same ways over and over again, right? The definition of insanity, insanity. doing the same things over and over again, <laughs> expecting, expecting a different, different result. Results. By that pause, <laughs> by that pause and that breathing, we can actually remember that maybe we want something different this yeah. time. Mm-hmm. And we actually have a lot of ability to shift, even if it's just, having a new idea, having a new thought, or stepping away from a moment. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the, the possibilities are endless depending on the relationship dynamic and the two people who are in that conflict at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's time, it's time for us to start really, um, not just in our marriages and our couples, but you know, I'm on a mission to shift this paradigm of conflict on the mm-hmm. planet. Yes. Like that's right, yeah. and I do it with couples and families because because I think this is where people are most incentivized to have a different relationship. Um, but it's also, in a way, the easiest, right? Yeah. Solving world hunger, mm-hmm. creating world peace is a much bigger challenge, right? But co- going home and doing something differently with your spouse, maybe it feels a little small easier step. then. Mm-hmm. Taking a one small and you know, step. Yeah. What I'm getting from your book also in this discussion as well is that you don't have to throw the baby out with the bathwater just because there's a conflict, right? I mean, I think that we all have relationships with our exes that is very powerful. I know I have a great relationship with my ex because I didn't kill him off, right? Just because we have conflict in our relationships doesn't mean the person is no good. It yes. just means that there's a conflict. Exactly. and. Everything can be worked out with communication and reverence, right? And so I love that people have the option to get your book and to work with you because we need to get that message across. Mm -hmm. You don't throw a person away. I mean, like, really, would you throw your child away just because... You know, they get to be a teenager and Maybe they fight with us all the time. Maybe this one day. Maybe one day. Sometimes we gotta throw some people away. <laughs> which and this us, actually is going to be a So good. Let me set this up. Let me set this up. So, okay. so we we started off um, with uh, talking about like feeling confident and feeling sexy again. Right and um, entering into the relationship feeling like yourself. And then we we moved on to um, sex. <laughs> Hello, good sex, <laughs> really good <laughs> sex, good sex. <laughs> and and um, we've traveled through conflict and resolving that. But sometimes you just can't do it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> sometimes um, we say, oh, this is not this is no longer serving me. Sometimes we break up. Mm-hmm. And so um, let's 
let's turn the conversation in the, in the last, you know, last 10 minutes that we have here with each, with each other. Let's yeah, talk about yeah. breakups and yeah. moving through that. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah. I would love to introduce Lenina. Huh? My <laughs> friend Lenina over here, this powerhouse of a woman. Yeah. She is a spirituality um, psychologist and an expert in um, the spiritual psychology blend of relationships. And she helps women deal with breakups. Yeah. So beautiful yeah. goddess of this. What is the t- title of your book again? My book is called... I ain't thinking about you. I ain't thinking about you. <laughs> the eight step guide to finally letting him go using the breakup funeral method. The breakup yeah. funeral yeah. method. Yeah. So, um, in your book, mm-hmm. this beautiful book, I ain't thinking about you. Um, you break down. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. You break down. <laughs> I'm not thinking about you. You break down getting over breakups. How does one do that exactly? Mm. Okay. Fill so, <laughs> I find um, this is a very personal book for me because I, I talk about my own um, uh, breakup and how I overcame it. Mm-hmm. And um, part of it was getting clear, um, moving through shame. Um, mm-hmm. Because the, the shame part of it, like, oh my God, mm-hmm. this, I got ghosted. By the way, I got ghosted, and that's a terrible way to break up with someone. Um, 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 maybe I deserved it. Maybe um, I'm unworthy. Maybe all that, all the shame stuff was like the first hurdle to overcome in um, in healing after a breakup and my breakup. And um, for anybody watching, uh, perhaps this will serve you. It's not your fault. You didn't do anything wrong. Absolutely. It didn't work out. You have nothing to be ashamed of. Can you go back really quick and explain yeah. what ghosting is just really quickly okay, so that okay. everybody understands why this is so traumatizing, really? Okay, so um, ghosting is a term used to describe how someone breaks up with you with no notice. They just disappear, disappear. like a ghost. <laughs> okay, and um, it brings up issues of like um, unworthiness, abandonment, um, maybe trigger some past childhood trauma that I that I experienced and um, when I went through uh, this breakup. And so I'll say this. I don't know that I've ever been ghosted before, but the one time it happened to me that I really remember, it like floored me, crushed me. Mm. <laughs> Everyone yeah. said, mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. That's a testimonial. Because <laughs> mm-hmm. there's not yeah. this yeah. sensation of completion. Right? It's left incomplete, which is one of the biggest traumas in any situation yeah. Yeah. that we can have. And we're constantly trying to figure out what happened. Right? Yeah. So, getting to that place of closure. Yeah. Closure, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 So, so um, I, I see you're about to say something, Erica, <laughs> but um, I've got to spill this out. Yes. Um, spill it. One of the, I found that I needed to closure, I needed to close the relationship, and I couldn't get it from him because he wouldn't answer his phone. And so, and so I created this method, the breakup funeral method. Um, and in short, it's like a, um, it's a, a fire ceremony in which you write down what, what it is that you want to let go of. And just to really visualize and um, see the, um, the ending, mm-hmm. watching um, the paper that you, you wrote down what it is that you're letting go of burn and saying, okay, it's complete. Oh, I don't need. To, I don't need it to hear it from him. So I can complete good. myself. Yeah. 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 Well, Anina, you know, yeah. a common a question that comes up in discussion often is, why am I always choosing the wrong man? Oh, that's a good question. Why am I choosing the wrong man? <laughs> so, how can you um, help women navigate through this? Okay. So, uh, one of the things that um, uh, I've researched was. Um, uh, I don't know. Okay. Cancel, cancel. How about this? <laughs> One, um, there's this idea like you're doing something wrong because you keep calling in this, this um, you keep attracting the wrong kind of people, the wrong men, and they keep doing you wrong. They keep ghosting or they keep cheating or uh, something else equally horrific um, that I can't think of. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, th- there's this idea that, okay, Maybe there's something wrong with me. 
And that's also part of the shame story that we tell ourselves. Absolutely. And so um, getting to the place of um, um, why do I keep attracting these men is recognizing that um, you're, you're not doing anything wrong. Um, and you're not responsible for how they showed up. Mm -hmm. And there's an element of um, we are attracted to what feels familiar. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. And yep. so um, one of the stories I share in my book is that um, uh, when I, you, Freud has this theory like, you know, you, you date your mom, you date your dad. But I couldn't, you know, really wrap my mind around that because I was like, I don't have any daddy issues. And um, then I remembered, like, when I was um, a child, um, I, when I was four, um, I had a really close relationship with my uncle. And then one day he disappeared. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I really made that about me not being good enough or worthy enough to, to mm -hmm. like, stay for me. And so, as a, and as I as an adult, um, I had this realize, realization that I was recreating the relationship that I had with my uncle. So it would be really loving, passionate for a few months, couple weeks, and then it would end. Mm -hmm. And it was what felt familiar. Also, I didn't realize that I was doing this. It was like a pathology that I didn't realize, but it felt familiar. So it was not necessarily that I was the one who was calling in these men, I keep choosing them. It was familiar. We, it's a cognitive bias. We choose what feels familiar to us. Mm. The, the unknown, mm -hmm. and the unknown is scary as hell, even if we know with 100% certainty mm -hmm. that it's a better option for us, mm -hmm. right? The devil you know versus the devil you don't know. Right. Or, yeah. Yeah. The abyss is way more scary to yeah. like step up into something you don't yeah. know. Well, and one of the things that, you know, there's, there's this idea of ghosting, and I think it's used a lot in dating, culture right now, but I also think about it in the context of married couples or long-term partnerships that end without resolution, mm -hmm. right? People who get to the point where they're, they're, they may mm -hmm. be clear, or at least they're, they're showing by their actions that they're out. Um, so if you can go into a little bit more about, you know, how do you really get that closure, especially when you're not there with a partner or a boyfriend or that person to have that together. Oh. How do you really do that on your own? Okay. Um, I have an exercise that I, I do um, as part of the breakup funeral. And um, whenever I share it, people are like, oh my God, I didn't even realize I had all this in me that I needed to get out. Mm -hmm. And it was like highly cathartic. And so instead of me describing it, how about I, you know, walk you all through it. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. um, we'll do a short exercise, um, like a quick 30 second. Um, it's going to be a role play. Um, so um, you have a picture of someone that um, you don't have, you need closure around, right? Um, what is it that you most want to hear from them? Mm. Now, in their voice, say it to yourself. So I can, I'll, I'll do a little something. Usually this is something that is written. Mm -hmm. and Like a journal entry. Yeah, like right on a piece of paper. Um, and um, one of the things I share um, in my book was, um, um, Dear Lenina, you know, I'm sorry I had to go. I wasn't ready for a relationship, and I didn't know how to say it. You are, you are lovable, you are beautiful, and you are kind. I was falling in love with you and I didn't know what to do. Mm. Signed, ghost. I've got yeah, goosebumps. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's beautiful. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So I invite, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I invite you all like, watching at home to uh, do this exercise. Don't go longer than 10 minutes. Like, I know you all have a lot that you, <laughs> that you want to say. That we want right? to hear. That, that we want to hear. <laughs> so like... Don't lay out a whole entire scroll, but like, you know, set a timer 10 minutes and say the words that you most want to hear because your brain doesn't know the difference. Yeah, it's true. So true. Close it up for yourself. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And then burn it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah because yes. the burning actually sends that message yeah. up to source, right? Mm. Whatever you call source, yes. but that's the shamanic practice of burning things like sage or 
you know, Calisandro or, or a message mm-hmm. is to give the prayer up mm-hmm. to the universe where we know that the universe does way more than what we can ever control, mm-hmm. right? I'm Letting so go. glad you Beautiful. said that. It's so <laughs> I knew this would end up in the universe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Let's get to the universe. It's like the, the um, symbolically um, fire um, in in African spirituality, we're taught that um, there the elements, um, earth, um, uh, wind, air, well, wind and air, uh, water, <laughs> water, and fire, um, of all the elements, the only one that cannot stand alone is fire. It needs something to ignite it, uh, yeah. right? And also in my work in positive psychology, this is, um, positive psychology is a study of um, how to how to flourish, how to get people who are doing well to do even better. Mm-hmm. And there are um, 24 character strengths, one of which is hope. And hope of all the character strengths, character strengths like um, uh, uh, curiosity, humor, things like that, hope is the only character strength that cannot stand alone. It needs something negative to ignite it. Mm-hmm. And listen. <laughs> And so, and so, like in doing my my work and developing the breakup funeral, this like the symbolism all came together, and I'm like, we need fire to inspire hope, yes. to, to spark it. It yeah. needs yeah. this yeah. is yeah. like, the, and and our and our when our feelings of um, um, uh, hopelessness can fuel that, yes. can spark that fire in which will just like tra- radically transform, yeah. and yes. and close up this relationship, even mm-hmm. if. There isn't someone else to do it. Well, and I just want to like reiterate, really, for all four of us, um, having gotten to know this incredible group of women and and listening to each other's stories and the work we've been doing with people. So often we hear like, "I can't do this until," "I can't do this right until I'm partnered," "until I'm skinny," "until I'm," you know, confident or whatever it is. And I think that what you're the point you're really bringing us as we're coming to completion here yeah. is that this is inner personal individual work like that yes. if we own that and and then we can really start doing this work today at this moment whatever our situation is whatever area we're we're working with right now in our lives and and it's so beautiful and that that kind of closure and completion and confidence and intimacy is within us yeah yeah. It yeah. has to start within us. And it starts within us. Because really, we're having our own human experience, and you all are just a reflection of me. And I'm a reflection of you and you, and yeah. it has to start inside us yeah. first. Yeah. So any, as we close this up with like one minute, um, do you have a, a word or two to, to gift our viewers? Mm. Some closing words. Since we're talking about closure, let's just close this out. Just one word? <laughs> or a phrase. Or a phrase. A thought. When, when in doubt, this is what um, I say in my book, when in doubt, ground first, which is exactly what we did. Look, it's, it's a very vulnerable thing going Excellent. into a conversation that we're sharing with the world, essentially. Um, and writing a book as an author, it's very, we've all had different experiences of, oh my God, this courageous vulnerability is really mm. daring. When in doubt, and when in doubt, ground. ground. ground it's what we did before this right. masterclass. It's yeah. what I recommend to everybody because if you ground, right. then you can fly as high as your kite wants to go. And Excellent. Yeah, there you go. I love <laughs> that. Yeah. Yeah, I think for me, I mean, no matter what happens in your life, no matter what, I think if there's a tenant that's really important to remember is that you are 100% lovable. You're 100% capable and you're 100% worthy. Mm-hmm. No matter what circumstance you find yourself in life, always, I know and it's really, it can be really difficult sometimes, but really start to really feel about how that sits with you and really start to embody that for yourself. And then you start from there. You start from that place of worthiness and love, love, lovability and capability. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Belinda. Me? Yeah. You. Your greatest, um, your most difficult relationships and conflicts can be your greatest teachers. Mm-hmm. Because I'll close it up with um, Carl Jung has this quote that I really, really love. And it goes something like this, paraphrasing, um, the closer we get to love, uh, 
the more the things that are unlike it come up. Yeah. <laughs> so we can deal with it and address it. Yeah. 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 Mm. yeah. Oh, no. On that note, note. On that thank note, you, lady. Thank you. 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 Thank you.